Welcome to the Donia Human Rights Center annual Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture. My name is Kyotaro Tsutsui. I'm the director of the Donia Human Rights Center. It is a pleasure to welcome you all to this annual lecture, which our center launched two years ago to honor Dr. King's legacy today as we face continuing and exacerbating human rights violations on African Americans, uh, refugees, and other marginalized populations. Uh, we have had two excellent speakers, the first one being the renowned historian Carol Anderson two years ago, and uh, the second one being the Pulitzer Prize winning Professor James Foreman Jr. last year. Uh, both of these lectures are up on our YouTube channel, so please uh, visit that channel. Um, and today I'm honored and delighted to be able to introduce Professor Khalil Muhammad of uh, Harvard Kennedy School. Professor Muhammad is a historian by training, having earned his PhD in American history at Rutgers University. And he was also an Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral fellow at the Vera Institute of Justice before becoming assistant professor of history at Indiana University. After earning tenure there, he took the position of the director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, a very important uh, division of the New York Public Library and the world's leading library and archive of global black history. And since 2016, he has been at Harvard Kennedy School as professor of history, race, and public policy. And he's also the uh, Suzanne Young Murray Professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies. His research has focused on racial criminalization in modern US history. And his book, The Condemnation of Blackness, Race, Crime, and the Making of Modern Urban America, was a path-breaking work that uncovered the historical origin of pervasive racism in America's criminal justice system. Uh, the key finding of the book highlights the role of white liberals and progressives in the North rather than more overtly racist Southerners. And he will say more about why in the lecture, but uh, I'd like to say here that this book is a tool force offering a historical account of how the toxic mix of race and criminality was concocted, uh, the toxic mix that continues to harm African-American communities until today. Uh, the book was originally published in 2010 uh, to much acclaim, winning the John Hope Franklin Best Book Award in American Studies. And a new edition, new preface, uh, just came out in 2019. So he will update some of his findings um, today. Uh, we're very privileged to hear from a leading historian of race relations in the US today. And uh, he's also a frequent contributor to contemporary debates about race in the criminal justice system. Uh, his work has been featured in a number of national print and broadcast media outlets, including the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Washington Post, NPR, MSNBC, and so on. Uh, and his voice has also contributed to an influential National Research Council study, several popular, uh, popular documentaries on Netflix and PBS, and also the viral 1619 project of the New York Times that explores and exposes the true history of slavery in America. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Khalil Muhammad. Thank you, Dr. Sitsui. Uh, I am very much delighted to be here at the Donia Center and uh, to uh, see so many come out. This is terrific. Um, I also want to thank all the uh, students who came to uh, meet me uh, for about an hour before uh, joining you here this afternoon. Um, it's been great to be back at Michigan. I haven't been here in a long time. And uh, my daughter applied, so maybe I'll get to come back uh, more frequently. Uh, there are about a half dozen seats scattered in front, so don't be shy. Come up and grab them. Um, also, um, the first student one of about 15 that I ever taught at Rutgers University, my second uh, year as a graduate student back in the summer of 1996, uh, is now the pastor of an AME church here in Ann Arbor, uh, Mashad Evans, Pastor Mashad Evans, would you stand please? 
And I know he's doing some great work in the community, uh, both amongst uh, members of his congregation, but also uh, with the local police community. So uh, a lot of good folks here. And then uh, someone who helped hire me at Indiana University. Um, I'm a little ashamed that I'm still stuck on this first book, but nevertheless, Jeff Weidlinger, uh, who's a professor here, uh, came out today. He's an old friend. Um, so, and if there's anyone else in the audience that, uh, that I'm uh, connected with, uh, I, I'm not mentioning you because I haven't seen you yet, but uh, thanks for coming out. Um, so let me get started. I'll, I'll admit this is a long lecture. Uh, we're going to have a half an hour for Q&A at the end, so I'll wrap up uh, just about uh, 5 o'clock. Um, but uh, I think it'll be worth the wait. So let me get started. Um, because this is a King-inspired uh, talk, I thought I would uh, open uh, with Dr. King and sort of set the tone for how I think about the work that he did while he was here in the midst of this massive social movement with so many moving uh, pieces and individuals who contributed, uh, as well as uh, what perhaps King couldn't see uh, that ought to bring us to our own fierce urgency of now. So for the young folks in the audience, um, and this itself has become a big cliché about uh, why the I Have a Dream speech itself uh, is a poor reflection uh, of the broader critiques that Dr. King was making for America. But nevertheless, um, so in 1963, Dr. King um, spoke amongst many, uh, but most certainly gave the most memorable of a long line of speeches calling out uh, the way in which race and racism had not only been foundational to the nation's economic and political uh, history, uh, but remained uh, at its heart um, its um, most profound conundrum uh, for the very definition of freedom. And so here, uh, in one part of the speech that is lesser remembered, he says, there are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating, for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, 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 we are not satisfied and will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And one more brief passage. I am not unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unarmed suffering is redemptive. So that ought to help us think about the context in which Dr. King recognized the centrality of what he recognized as the persecution of the American Negro with respect to police brutality. And so this is a contemporary uh, moment. Here is uh, Bill Bratton. Um, giving a speech in 2017 at the Heritage Foundation, uh, reflecting on the past 50 years since the civil rights era on law enforcement in America. As you note in the slide, policing in America. Now, I had heard uh, Bill Braden as a New Yorker at the time and uh, the head of a major cultural institution. I'd been involved in some closed door meetings with community leaders at the time. And, I'd heard some version of this speech, although uh, not entirely this one. And what I noted in his presence uh, in these closed door meetings was that he had taken to talking about the history of slavery and Jim Crow as part of a, part of a shameful legacy uh, 
uh, of policing in America, of which uh, today was quite different, but nevertheless should be mindful of that history. Shortly after that, about a year later, I attended a conference by the New York Times called Cities for Tomorrow. And this was a conference focused on data, data, the use of new technologies and data analytics for everything from urban-based environmental sustainability to crime control. And there was Bratton talking about New York's latest crime-fighting tool. Uh, he was very proud of this. Uh, in fact, he described it as the newest release of the pioneering crime mapping software, CompStat, uh, which as many of you know, and I certainly will talk about a bit uh, later, uh, had been at the heart of stop and frisk policing um, going back to the 1990s. He likened this new version, uh, something he called CompStat 2.0, uh, to the 2002 version of Minority Report, uh, which some of you might know uh, starts Tom Cruise as head of a special uh, pre-crime unit set in Washington, D.C. in the year future 2054. Officers gathered intelligence from a trio of precogs, human-like beings who can predict murders and identify killers before they act. Uh, Braddon was almost giddy about the comparison. The unintended pun on the film's title uh, seemed to escape him. Uh, he said of CompStat 2.0 uh, that it was uh, discriminating, not discriminatory, that it was predictive and not prejudicial. Uh, and so, he had some strong uh, uh, opinions and confidence about the future of this technology and moving policing forward. And so you might be surprised, like I was, when I then heard, watched, and listened uh, to this 2017 Heritage speech, of which I'm going to play you uh, a brief clip. Um, in the clip, uh, he is uh, going to start talking about the Kerner Commission, and so that's what I want you to key on. How does Bratton talk about the Kerner Commission report, uh, which was released in 1967 on the heels uh, of a series of urban rebellions, including Detroit's, um, and therefore uh, became part of a national conversation about the very thing that Dr. King had described uh, between Mississippi and New York. Uh, so uh, we're going to roll the clip. Correct the abuses of the past, the third degree, the failure to inform uh, uh, people under the rest of their rights. They were necessary changes to deal with the issues of the 60s as we moved into the 70s and 80s. But the pendulum swung too far. Police corruption gave rise to police oversight. And police reform grew out of reports like the Kerner Commission, and all of it commingled with new ideas about the origins of crime. Kerner Commission report. I had to read this book, literally almost memorize it, to take my sergeant's promotional exam in 1974 in the Boston Police Department. It was part of the professionalization and liberalization of police agencies at that time. The books I had to study to pass the promotional exam for sergeant. I was the youngest sergeant ever promoted in the history of the Boston Police Department at age 27, a sign of the changing times. We read this book. We read the American Bar Association report on race relations in the United States. We read Wisenhand. We read, I read I and Own on management and theory. The idea of one of the recommendations of this book, the professionalization of the police. But this report and the preceding crime report that the President Lyndon Johnson had commissioned set us on a path for the next 20 years that literally brought us to the 1990s. While there were so many extraordinary good recommendations here, a lot of what we talk about today, legitimacy of policing efforts, there was one that really tore us apart. The idea that we should focus on response to crime, that they believed at that time that the causes of crime were racism, were poverty, were police practices in many instances, unemployment, demographics, they thought those were the causes. They were not, they are not, and never have been. But for 20 years, and I lived it, American policing was shaped by it. And I'll point to one line here in the report that sticks out to me, the idea that in, so in alleviating manpower to the ghetto, enforcement emphasis should be given to crimes that threaten life and property, stress on social gambling or loitering, when more serious crimes are neglected, 
not only diverts manpower, but fosters distrust and tension in the ghetto community. In that line, they advocated that American policing move away from disorder control. Thank you. Not understanding that African Americans in their neighborhoods. So I'm going to repeat what he said, just in case uh, you didn't catch the line. Um, uh, in this speech, he celebrates in a earlier moment, the theoretical founders of broken windows policing, the criminologist George Kelling and the political scientist James Q. Wilson, uh, who he describes as two personal heroes of mine. But he also repudiated the Kerner Commission findings, which he said he had read in 1974 to pass the sergeant's exam for the Boston Police Department. And here he notes, quote, they believed at the time that the causes of crime were racism, were poverty, were police practices, in many instances, unemployment, demographics, they thought these were the causes. They were not, they are not, and they never have been. So this is 2017. He's now retired. He'd been police officer for six separate departments, as he says in the speech, as small as 38 members of the department, as large as 38,000, uh, representing New York from one coast to the other, both Los Angeles and the Big Apple. And so we're presented with our present in this moment uh, against all of the momentum that would seemingly be moving us towards a different, different conceptualization um, of the relationship of law enforcement to social justice. Uh, and for any of my colleagues that might be wondering why I'm still talking about the condemnation of blackness, it is the gift that keeps on giving precisely uh, because this past will not go away. So let's take about 25 minutes to talk about that past uh, so we can better understand what it is exactly that Bratton is talking about. So um, just a few key words because I found over the years that uh, these terms are not uh, commonly used. Mass incarceration perhaps is the most commonly one used one now, but uh, people might wonder exactly uh, what the difference between racial criminalization is such. So just to read them, racial criminalization is defining or stigmatizing a racial group of people as criminal, regardless of guilt or innocence. Mass criminalization using the law and policy to limit the freedom of a group of people, regardless of guilt or innocence. And so one can have uh, racial criminalization, that is the idea of a criminal class, um, without using the law or public policy to, in fact, arrest or use the agencies of criminal justice to control those people. And then finally, mass incarceration, which I know uh, Angela Davis spoke about uh, on Monday and which so many others have uh, come to understand since Michelle Alexander published The New Jim Crow, is about imprisoning as many people as possible who have been convicted of crimes and or stigmatized as criminal. Uh, so one way to think about this is historically, we have had both racial criminalization and mass criminalization. You might think of the South as a place of mass cr criminalization, but the South was not a place of mass incarceration. The point was not to warehouse people, to simply incapacitate them, uh, to disappear their bodies. The point was to use the coercive power of the criminal justice system uh, to command their labor for other purposes. Uh, and so mass incarceration is quite distinct uh, in more contemporary terms since the 1960s, since precisely the moment when uh, Dr. King left this earth. And so how is it possible uh, that this history um, has been unfolding uh, in a nation with uh, such a sterling constitution? Uh, First, that's a straw man for an argument that many nations around the world, particularly in the wake of uh, World War II, have far better protections for civil liberties and civil rights than our Constitution. Um, but nevertheless, uh, to understand our particular history, the 13th Amendment, as many of you now know, uh, has a slavery loophole. And that is that it abolished slavery uh, except as punishment uh, for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. Uh, this is still the law of the land. Uh, there has been no amendment to rescind that subclause of the 13th Amendment or to provide new guarantees um, in the face of the largest criminal justice system the world has ever known. Uh, so we have work to do, and it's always a delight 
to perhaps plant the seeds of an idea for students who might one day take on that work. And so let's go back to the beginning and walk through what the 13th Amendment made possible. With the end of slavery came the possibility uh, for uh, both mass emancipation and also the full participation of four million formerly enslaved people into the full life of the body politic. And yet the resistance uh, to that era of civil rights, which brought the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment, the 14th Amendment is essentially the constitutional basis of civil rights today, providing for due process protections, equal citizens, equal protection under the law, as well as birthright citizenship, the basis upon which anyone born in the United States is uh, a naturalized citizen. Um, at the same time, we have uh, the 15th Amendment, which guarantees the right to vote, which of course is uh, constantly up for uh, debate about the procedures for guaranteeing the right to vote. Uh, it is in fact not an affirmative right to vote. The Constitution only guarantees that that right shall not be abridged under certain conditions, uh, in which case the states protect your right to vote uh, and grant that right to vote, which is why we've had this tortured history uh, of various um, uh, laws that have narrowed the franchise. Um, so in that context, if we think about uh, the fundamental question of the humanity of black people, first as enslaved people, then as free people, from 1865 as a, the great turning point with the end of the Civil War, and the possibility through these civil rights enactments for full rights to their citizenship, the backlash against that moment uh, happened immediately. Uh, the Black Codes became a series of laws passed by each southern state to restrict African Americans and to build up the apparatus of criminal justice to restrain that freedom. They were quickly uh, ruled uh, illegal by a civil rights law of 1866. Uh, but the idea that the, the criminal justice system or some form of state-based racial control uh, might be effective is what is expressed here. Uh, this is one of many public intellectuals for that era, uh, published a book in 1868 of which he says, Negroes with their crime-stained blackness could not rise beyond base and beast-like savagery. Why should we forever degrade both ourselves and our posterity by entering of our volition into more intimate relations with him? May God in his restraining mercy forbid that we should ever do this foul and most wicked thing. Now, we could cherry pick any number of quotes to describe uh, white supremacist ideas of the period. Um, the point in this exercise is that this individual does not gesture towards uh, something that we might recognize today as the kind of empirical evidence for making certain kinds of truth claims uh, for African Americans uh, being more inclined to criminal activity or not. Uh, and that is the story of the role of crime statistics as a universalizing measure and tool, a form of communication uh, for saying that the crime statistics tell us precisely what black people are capable of, the kinds of choices they make, and whether or not by dint of those choices they are indeed deserving of their full citizenship. Those crime statistics, surprisingly enough, first uh, and in many ways took this form uh, this is uh, a role, a statistical account of lynching victims between 1877 and 1950. Uh, the estimated number um, of those that have been documented, which is to say that we will never know how many people uh, were killed uh, by some form of mob violence, uh, but the guess is around 4,400. Uh, and a, some renewed attention has been given to this because of the work of Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, of which he's just opened a new national memorial of peace and justice and a museum to accompany the memorial. So this is a bit of a, a signpost of the moment. Um, we, looking back, can see lynching statistics as evidence of state-sanctioned state domestic terrorism. And even to this day, of course, everyone doesn't agree with that. Uh, but let's just take, for argument's sake, that most of you agree with that characterization of these lynching victims. No matter how many people might, in fact, have been guilty of something, the state was complicit 
in the abridgment of these individuals' due process laws. Under no circumstances are citizens entitled to the right to execute another citizen on the basis of any legal claim. Um, and so to this day, no record of prosecutions for any lynching victims in the history of the United States of America. We don't get a federal hate crimes bill until the 1990s, so on and so forth. So what this was used as instead, in the language of Hinton, Rowe, or Helper, and those who came after him, was essentially every statistic of a lynching was a statistic of a black crime, and more particularly, a black male rape. And that's an important point to hold on to because the evidence such as this, the actual narratives, the stories of the circumstances that led to lynching were anything but, in too many instances, something about an actual criminal offense. Um, I'll just give you a moment to scan these six examples, uh, but these are mostly abridgments of the racial etiquette or the racial scripts of white supremacy in the Jim Crow South. Policing, as Dr. King referred to, the dignity of black people. Uh, and therefore, when these folks challenged their circumscribed social status, uh, could lead to lynching. So what do I mean about this universalizing national narrative of statistics? Um, well, it turns out that Similar to our own time, in an earlier post-civil rights era, that is the civil rights era of Reconstruction or the late 19th century that brought about those constitutional amendments by the radical Republicans, just substitute radical Democrats, um, and you have the same partisan context for those changes. It's, you know, also a moment when, of course, the first president was impeached precisely uh, for breaking a law and firing uh, a cabinet member. Um, won't go down that rabbit hole in the interest of my own time. But th in this post-civil rights era, there were competing claims about black people's humanity. And in the effort to resolve those competing claims, a number of social scientists uh, suggested that by looking at demographic data, particularly, say, the U.S. Census report um, on births and deaths, uh, morbidity rates, uh, on health statistics, one could make generalizable claims about the relative fitness of different racial groups. Now, we don't live in a time where white supremacists regularly, well, okay, I guess I can't say that. Um, let me back that up. We don't live in a time where political elites regularly, well, I can't say it that either, so let me try one more attack. Most people don't generally make claims about the red, relative racial fitness of various groups. The late 19th century was steeped in very explicit forms of scientific racism that we can't dismiss today, even before the Trump era, we can't dismiss today as quackery or as shoddy science or as a, a fringe part of uh, the scientific community. In fact, um, most scientists believed that races were not equally endowed and that on the average, uh, races had strengths and weaknesses. And therefore, the effort was to figure out the relative strengths and weaknesses of different racial groups, um, and then to assign them in society to the roles best fit um, for their talent. Uh, so the South Africans, for example, in the era of apartheid, uh, were very clear uh, about the possibilities for black South Africans to be anything more uh, than hewers of wood or drawers of water, as the 1952 Bantu Education Bill said, that was the best education for them. Also true that uh, in the late 19th century Reconstruction period, at the moment when industrial education becomes uh, the major focus of philanthropy in the United States, establishing the Rosenwald Fund and the General Education Board, a lot of the basic infrastructure of our own philanthropic giving, including how we define education as the core basis of nonprofit tax status uh, 
is born out of these questions about educating the freedmen as an appropriate um, uh, tax or charitable uh, tax classification. It's a fascinating history. Uh, but it was clear that northern elites and southern elites agreed upon essentially vocational training for black people. That was the best role for them. So this question of racial capacity was a national question. And turning to demographic data became the way to answer that question. And so here we have a Harvard scientist writing in the Atlantic Monthly, now called The Atlantic, same magazine, publishing Science and the African Problem, pointing out that statistics will lead the way to a new understanding of black people's true racial capacity. And so what did those statistics tell us? They told us that according to the 1890 US Census, African Americans were 30% of the nation's prison population and yet 12% of the general population. Most of us probably have some sense of what to make of this. But one could imagine in a community of human rights interested folk um, that you could take this in any direction. Uh, you could take that overrepresentation of the population as an evidence of political repression of a marginalized group of people or of a former warring nation of which the prisons were now flowing with prisoners of war. Um, you could take it as Southerners took it and increasingly Northerners in the wake of this statistic as evidence that, oh, we have an internal population of people who pose a fundamental threat to civil society, um, kind of in the way that the Trump administration has defined uh, Mexican immigrants. So you can see that the statistics don't in fact tell us exactly what to make of them. We decide what to make of them. And that was true then and it's true now. Uh, and so what did they make of this statistic? In fact, uh, this became the linchpin of a moment of national reconciliation between Southerners and Northerners that in fact black people did have a crime problem and in fact were uh, a criminal class. Um, now, Let's put a big fat asterisk on that. I'm not going to go into great detail about it, but you should, of course, remember uh, that the first efforts at circumscribing the new constitutional rights of African Americans was establishing a series of crime bills uh, to target black people's freedom and to challenge their right to actually walk with dignity and social equality. They were policing social equality more than anything else. Uh, and so to see the overrepresentation, they were essentially politically repressed. Nevertheless, where did this take us? So one of the first people to make sense of this national data was a man named Frederick Hoffman, who published a book in 1896 called Race, Traits, and Tendencies of the American Negro. Uh, and here he says something that has resonated from that moment to our own. The city Negro brought into direct competition with the white race has usually but one avenue out of his dilemma, the road to prison or to an early grave. And by, I say, by saying from that moment to our own, uh, many of you have either yourself or heard other people say uh, that the conditions of life for young black men today uh, means that they're either going to prison or they're going to die soon. And so the way in which the statistics of the overrepresentation of African Americans in our prison system going back to the very beginning, the 1890 census was essentially the first generational cohort of people never to have been enslaved. Therefore, those young people going to prison represented in that number represented, at least in the interpretation of that day, the evidence that without slavery, black people were doing worse than they were with slavery. And fast forward to our present, the evidence of an overpopulation continues to turn on this debate about why it is there are so many and what to do about it. So let's look at the road not traveled a little more closely, because that's in some ways the great conceit of this history. Here, a man named Frederick Hoffman, as I've already mentioned to you, four years before he pointed out uh, the fact of prison or early death for African Americans uh, based on the circumstances and conditions of life in the late 19th century, particularly in the South, had this to say about the industrial white working classes in places like Michigan uh, or New England. 
He said, the study of statistics of suicide, madness, and crime is one of the utmost importance to any society. When such an increase has been proved to exist, it is the duty of society to leave nothing undone until the evil has been checked or been brought under control. The health of the people must come before the wealth of the people. We must be far from truly civilized as long as we permit to exist or accept as inevitable conditions which year after year drive an increasing army of unfortunates to madness, crime, or suicide. It is the struggle of the masses against the classes. Now, some of you probably know about the work of Angus Deaton uh, uh, and his partner uh, from Princeton University, now re re retired, who were first to signal the alarm of the uh, increasing mortality rates of uh, white Americans between the ages of 45 and 54. These have now been taking up in tropes of deaths of despair attached to the opioid crisis, alcohol abuse, and other forms of uh, addiction-related uh, death. Um, and so the echo of deaths of despair and great armies of unfortunates suggests to us that evidence of drug or crime-related activity does not tell us how our state should respond. We're making choices uh, based on population groups and what they are deserving of or not. Uh, so here, Hoffman, very clearly, he could have been writing talking points for Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren um, in this class critique using crime as a symptom of economic inequality. And yet, uh, he wasn't alone. Uh, here is a progressive member of the Socialist and Labor Party community. Remember the late 19th century and early 20th century was ripe with socialism. Oh my gosh, that terrible uh, scourge on American society. No humor here today. <laughs> um, hundreds of small towns across America had elected socialist officials uh, in uh, municipal government. And so here is a representative of that time period uh, a man named Harry Vrooman in an article called Crime and the Enforcement of Law. The whole problem of crime as today expressed in society is summed up in the problem of poverty. We have churches enough, schools enough, moral sentiment enough to regenerate the world in a decade were it not for the awful pressure brought to bear on nine-tenths of the human race, which all but forces them to be vicious. Really clear lines of direction. These are, as social scientists would say, or economists, exogenous forces bearing down on individuals, calling them, causing them uh, to engage in antisocial behavior. It couldn't be clearer. And yet, returning back to Frederick Hoffman in Race, Traits, and Tendencies, now going back to uh, four years after he wrote the Arena article talking about the Great Army of Unfortunates, here he talks about the crime statistics. Prison and arrest statistics from Chicago, Philadelphia, Louisville, and Charleston, South Carolina, and from states including New Jersey and Pennsylvania confirm the census data and show without exception that the criminality of the Negro exceeds that of any other race of any numerical importance in this country. When the Negro learns to respect life, property, and chastity until he learns to believe in the value of a personal morality operating in his daily life, the criminal tendencies will increase. No great army of unfortunates. No class analysis. This is about cultural and racial inferiority. This is about personal responsibility. Uh, and the statistics prove it. So the policy implications of this spread like wildfire and very quickly. Uh, within a decade here, the governor of Mississippi uh, is not only calling out black people's crime problem, but also suggesting that education is contributing to it. To school the Negro is to increase his criminality. Official statistics do not lie, and they tell us that the Negroes who can read and write are more criminal than the illiterate. In New England, where they are best educated, they are four and a half times as criminal as in the Black Belt, where they are most ignorant Black Belt for, for the South. The more money for Negro education, the more Negro crime. This is the unmistakable showing of the United States Census. Now this might be ridiculous um, in our mind if we weren't living in the Trump era with regard to the, the, all kinds of creative math that proceeds with regard to immigrant crime being the real problem uh, that faces us on our borders when in fact we know that uh, our own citizens are overrepresented in terms of crime relative to immigrants, no matter what their background. Uh, so this is serious business. And indeed, the very basis of the educational foundation uh, in this country for African Americans, for whom 90%, nine out of 10, um, we're now experiencing education. Um, it is also true that Southern black elected officials often were the first to pass compulsory 
education laws in the South in the Reconstruction period, um, is being fundamentally undercut on the basis of crime statistics. And I write about this in the, in the new preface, but essentially this early understanding or linkage, this association between crime rates and education is still with us. Uh, we still have economists who are measuring school effectiveness on the basis of whether crime reduction is happening in that school district or not. And uh, you'll have to read more to see why that's such a problem. Um, black people didn't take this lying down, uh, and indeed for uh, more or less a first generation of black academics of any significance and critical mass took on Hoffman's arguments directly. Here's one a sociologist from Howard University publishing in 1909, a man named Kelly Miller, who in fact founded the sociology department at Howard University, where legal processes are acknowledged to be fair and where the Negro has the fullest educational opportunity. He shows a criminal rate three to four times as great as his ignorant and oppressed brother in the South, and the conclusion is hastily reached that education makes the Negro a criminal. Because I, yeah, I didn't tell you actually what was wrong with uh, what it is that Vardaman was saying, but Kelly Miller will tell us uh, instead of us having to figure it out on his own. So this is essentially a restatement of the claim. Uh, but this is his response. He says, okay, let me take on the data. It is true that black men are five times more likely in Massachusetts, New England, to serve time than in Mississippi. He says, but turns out that white men are 10 times overrepresented uh, relative uh, to Massachusetts and Mississippi. And so then he asked the question, if we were to just take the statistical argument alone, did education make northern whites criminal too? And then he answers his own question, or shall we foster the bliss of ignorance only when it is found under a black skin? Now, uh, I won't do this again, but I, does someone want to venture to guess how we reconcile this data? If it's all true, how can that be? No one wants to guess? All right. So uh, essentially, the reason why everyone is catching a case in Massachusetts relative to Mississippi is because Massachusetts had been building its criminal justice system since the 17th century. As one of the oldest parts of the country, it had a far more robust system. You were simply much more likely to be caught um, if you, in fact, did something against the law in Massachusetts than in Mississippi, which was essentially still a frontier uh, society at the time. So other African Americans responded to because the association of criminality didn't just shape education policy in the United States. It also essentially underwrote racial violence. Evidence of black criminality became an excuse for racial terror. And indeed, this is an illustration by a French journal of a riot in Atlanta, Georgia in 1906. Uh, and in that uh, riot, uh, there was a gubernatorial contest between uh, two men competing for which one would better put the Negro back in his place. Uh, it turns out black Atlantans uh, were quite adept uh, at taking advantage of the full fruits of their freedom, uh, not only because of the presence of significant HBCUs, Morehouse, Spelman, Atlanta University, Clark College, uh, but also an entire generation of African Americans who had invested in the segregated communities um, in small businesses. And so their economic and educational success actually became targets of racial resentment. They weren't following the racial script they had been given. And so the evidence of their success uh, then became uh, part of a contest between two governors who were going to put them back in their place. Out of that, an allegation of a sexual assault on an elevator led to essentially a racial pogrom uh, where black people were wantonly killed uh, in the streets. Uh, move up to Chicago, Illinois several months later at a fundraising dinner for uh, the woman who became the leading anti-lynching uh, activist in the United States, a woman named Ida B. Wells. Uh, she's sitting at a dinner table and a white woman who was a suffragist and a club woman, a fellow organizer, both for the right to vote as well as for poor people in Chicago and providing some nascent support for even Ida B. Wells' civil rights effort in that city, says, I don't know what we can say about this terrible affair in reference to the Atlanta riot, but there is one thing I can say, and that is to urge all of you to drive the criminals out from among you. 
Have you forgotten that 10% of all the crimes committed in Chicago last year were by colored men, less than 3% of the population? So part of what I need you to see is that very quickly from Hinton, Rowe, and Helper's sort of generalizable claims about crime-stained blackness to Hoffman uh, weaponizing census data and then that spreading into public policy questions about education, now in Chicago, in the freedom-loving North, um, we've got dinner table conversation that turns not on domestic terrorism that African Americans are facing as a virtue of their success in the South, but in fact on disproportionate crime statistics. So as long as you can point to some evidence that African Americans are overrepresented in crime statistics, you can defend just about anything in these great United States of America. And that's exactly what's happening in this dinner conversation. So Ida B. Wells uh, had already been doing this work for a long time. Uh, she'd already written a book called Southern Horrors, Lynch Law and Its Phases, published in 1892. She had already looked at the actual record that whites often turn to uh, for making the claim that every lynching was evidence of a black rape or crime. Uh, in fact, uh, the Chicago Tribune functioned in that day to record lynching data in the same way that the Washington Post and the Guardian do today to keep track of police killings, whether they are justified or not, whether the victim is armed or unarmed. And so here she says, out of their mouths shall murderers be condemned by virtue of reading the Chicago Tribune for its own reporting on lynching. Uh, when she does a statistical tabulation, she notes that the rape myth was a myth, that only 31% in the newspaper reporting had only even been charged with rape, let alone whether they were actually guilty of such. She also debunks the myth of black female licentiousness. She reports on racial narratives, that is, reporting of white male rape of black women. She gives one example of a man named Pat Hannafan of Nashville, Tennessee, uh, who as she says, outraged a little colored girl uh, for his penalty. Uh, Pat Hannafin was not strung up in a tree or set on fire uh, um, on a pyre of wood, uh, but in fact served six months in jail and then became a city detective. Uh, some of this evidence began to weigh on people like Nathaniel Shaler, the Harvard scientist who called for racial statistics as a way to, to measure the true capacity of various demographic groups. Uh, and so here he's saying uh, in Popular Science magazine, same magazine in circulation today, that he was inclined to believe that on the whole there is less danger to be apprehended from them, that is, blacks, in this regard than from an equal body of whites of the like social grade. So this was a breakthrough. Okay, so that's one part of the history. It's an important part of the history because it establishes essentially what racial criminalization and mass criminalization look like. But to sh throw in even sharper relief what those aspects of criminalization look like, we might also say, okay, so we know we have a crime problem in America in general across all social demographic groups. That was precisely the argument of the great army of unfortunates of which the socialists were trying to redistribute some of the capital in America. That was, in fact, the era of the robber barons or the Gilded Age that was giving way to the progressive era. And so um, just to document that there was, at least in the mind uh, and in the social science of the time, people studying immigrants who were then Southern and Eastern European, as well as Asian and Latino, although Asians had been uh, excluded from the United States by 1882. Uh, and so largely the immigration problem is now still focusing on the lesser European tribes uh, here in the country. And so the Irish had the highest rates of petty crime and the Italians topped the list for major felonies, according to Frederick Bushy in his Boston study in 1903. There was a moral degradation among Irish families as a result of drink, which is not found among other nationalities, for quarrels, which are serious fares, for flashes of anger, which mean a knife thrust, one must go to the Italian quarters. Uh, so this wasn't just uh, a, a script draft for a Martin Scorsese film. Um, these were, in fact, um, uh, often Anglo-Saxon elites uh, engaging in the kind of social science research uh, trying to understand what the immigration relationship was to the crime problem in the nation. Uh, except that where this led us was not um, to calls for uh, more policing, but in fact to a more robust social safety net. 
Uh, the Progressive Era brought forth a number of interventions using state resources to alleviate the economic anxieties and the class problems, to mitigate those exogenous uh, forces working against these people. They did still close the borders, of course, in 1924. The eugenicists and the social Darwinists uh, did win part of the argument. Um, but for those who got to stay, economists and others generally describe these folks as Americans in process. Uh, or as fellow passengers on our ship of state. Even Hoffman himself said the Irish and the Italians show a percentage of arrest decidedly above the average. It's small when compared with that of the colored element. Part of what is happening here is an economic argument for prioritizing resources. Social resources for European immigrants who are Americans in process, crime control resources uh, for people of African uh, descent. Uh, the most significant famous sociologists of the period, black sociologists of the period, not Miller, but W.E.B. Du Bois in 1910, had this to say, murder may swagger, theft may rule, and prostitution flourish, and the nation gives but spasmodic, intermittent, and lukewarm attention. But let the murderer be black, or the thief brown, and the righteousness of indignation sweeps the world. It is blackness that is condemned, and not crime. So you always have to know uh, that this is not a story of uh, no black resistance, uh, of simple oppression. Black people are offering counter-narratives all along the way. And in fact, those counter-narratives begin to grow in significance. Uh, this is an illustration from uh, the first national civil rights organization that begins in 1910. By 1913, it has a monthly publication called The Crisis. And here it is pointing out a racial double standard in the crime discussion. The caption uh, is American Logic uh, for this cartoon. On the left here, I like to say that uh, these two respectable gentlemen, one white, one black, are being shadowed uh, by two men for that era who are sagging. Uh, their pants are not below their waist, uh, but in fact, their, their choice of clothing, their appearance, um, puts them in the same morally ambiguous category. Uh, and so here the caption says, this man is not responsible for this man, even if they do, do belong to the same race. This man is responsible for all that this man does because they belong to the same race. Um, so we see two different responses um, to the actual question of social marginality, uh, of which in one group, crime is not only um, an uh, understandable response, uh, but it does not taint those particular groups in the way uh, that they do African Americans. Um, so one other strain of this moment that would give rise to the policy resp response to the ledgers of crime on the white side of the color line was, in fact, um, how progressives began to intervene in the crime uh, uh, situation in inner city America. Here is uh, an illustration from an annual report published by a prisoner reentry organization called the Central Howard Association, uh, published in 1907 uh, in Chicago. And so the caption here is how criminals are made. So before we read the cap caption together, uh, first thing you should see is uh, this is an inner city uh, community. Uh, here we have uh, potentially, we're not clear, uh, a single mother uh, with one, two, three, four, five children. Um, she's poor because she lives uh, in a dilapidated home in presumably a bad neighborhood. How do we know it's a bad neighborhood? Uh, because it's got broken windows. Uh, and of course, every bad neighborhood with broken windows has a saloon somewhere around the corner. And of course, every community with uh, some den of vice and broken windows and poor people and a bunch of bad kids has some abusive police officer carting somebody off on the street corner. So this is what a broken windows story looks like when it was white. And so here is what progressives had to say about it. So long as there are bad tenements, sweatshops, brutal policemen, bad jails, child labor, dishonest and grinding employers, saloons and gambling dens, so long as boys are taught to fight and allowed to carry firearms, so long as fathers are indifferent deserters and mothers must maintain the family by the washboard, so long crime will continue. What will you help to do to prevent this, to help this association to prevent it? So these are very clear calls for social investment uh, and political change um, in helping these people. 
this is not a call for racial control, quarantine, social quarantine. That organization uh, was just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, many of you, of course, know of Jane Addams, might have heard of her before. She was uh, the leading uh, social worker uh, of the progressive era, published many books, of which one was The Spirit of Youth in City Streets. Uh, what's fascinating about this is, according to uh, her biographer, uh, this book published in 1909, the initial title was going to be uh, Juvenile Delinquency and Public Recreation. Uh, but she didn't like that title because she thought juvenile delinquency dehumanized the young people. Um, so of course, instead of a picture of uh, poor kids with their hands on bars, uh, here we have a bunch of young people on some kind of country day trip uh, having a grand old time. Um, but in the story, what did she tell us? She told us a story about 15,000 young people brought before the juvenile court, which had only been in operation for about five years. Chicago's was the first. Who were these kids? They stole from their parents, swiped junk, pawned their clothes and shoes, did any desperate thing to get the dope, as they called it. They were violent in some instances. A Polish youth shot an Irish boy in the head. She writes, this tale could be duplicated almost every morning. What might be merely a boyish scrap is turned into a tragedy because some boy has a revolver. And so, of course, we talk a lot about personal choices, right? We still have a really hard time about violence in Detroit or Chicago as compared to school shootings where everyone's a victim except the shooter. We're less sure about victimization in inner city communities today, except Jane Adams was uh, unambiguous. She says, we certainly cannot expect the fathers and mothers who have come to the city from farms or who have immigrated from other lands to appreciate or rectify these dangers, nor could we expect the young people themselves to kill the cancer of modern city conditions. And so begins what amounts to an eight decades long redistribution of social resources, of tax dollars, of on-ramps uh, to better jobs and better communities and exit ramps out of poverty for America's white working classes, of which the most recent crisis in some ways reflects a reversal of those fortunes that has been unfolding since the 1980s. But prior to that, uh, this is what led to um, the sets of laws of which the New Deal was perhaps um, the largest expression of redistribution to build a universal social welfare system uh, that in its own legislative and practical policy implications also excluded African Americans and other domestic workers, including uh, Mexican Americans. So last part of this talk is now going to return to policing because um, part of the story that is lesser known uh, is that since immigrants got a lot of help, what did those northerners get? they got a lot of policing. And so uh, the Chicago race riot, and I apologize for this, I won't hold this uh, for very long, uh, occurs in the summer of 1919. Uh, it is a contest over jobs and housing of which African Americans are new migrants uh, to uh, this industrial behemoth. They are economic refugees and uh, from domestic uh, terrorism of the South. Uh, and as they are increasingly being constrained to a very narrow swath of what became Chicago's Black Belt, they are rubbing up against their European immigrant neighbors who themselves were often confined uh, by dint of class and language uh, differences. Uh, and all hell breaks loose, not only in Chicago, uh, but more than two dozen other cities, many of them outside of the South, both during the Red Summer of 1919, before and after. East St. Louis in 1917, Washington, D.C., um, a couple of years later. Uh, so what happens? There's a first Blue Ribbon Commission to study what the hell went on. 500 people are injured. Uh, the whole thing sets off when a black child, a teenager, is stoned to death because he's swimming in Lake Michigan and he happens to cross some invisible aqueous color line and white people stone the kid to death. Black people who are there on the beach say, hey, those people just killed that kid. And the cop says, what do I have to do with this? Um, and so out of black people's protest and anger, white people then respond, how dare they get anger, angry and start pulling black folks off of uh, trolley cars. Black people start pulling them off of trolley cars. And when the dust settles, uh, the 
number of people killed, 500, I'm sorry, the number of people killed were 38, 23 black folks, 15 white. The vast majority of those arrested for all of this were in fact black people, not white people. And so this first Blue Ribbon Commission, think of it as the first Kerner Commission report, is published in 1922, and here's what they find. Criminal justice officials were more likely to arrest Negroes more freely than whites, to book them on more serious charges, to convict them more readily, and to give them longer sentences. A municipal court judge stated that he personally knew about certain police who were going into Negro clubs and arresting Negroes they found there, bringing them to court without a bit of evidence of any offense. Another judge discussed why large numbers of blacks were arrested for suspicion, attributing it to a lesser regard for the rights of black men compared to white men. I think they hesitate a little longer when a white man is involved. I am certain that it is so. And finally, a former chief of police agreed, noting that Southern migrants naturally attracted greater suspicion than would attach to the white men who had lived for a greater length of time in the same district and who would be more easily identified and traced, um, so on and so forth. So this is incredible evidence coming from within and literally an all-white criminal justice system. There's one black prosecutor uh, in Illinois at the time. Um, and so you would think this would carry a lot of weight. And uh, this is just another photograph from uh, these are black people being stopped and frisked in the midst of uh, defending themselves against um, a racist attack against the black community. So one of the recommendations that came out of this, believe it or not, was stop using racial crime statistics. They're part of the problem. They're feeding this idea that black people are a criminal race and causing white people to kill them, literally, in the street. This is a bad idea. And it's actually uh, compelling to the first major American criminologist in the country, a man named Edwin Sutherland, who published two leading textbooks at the time. So people coming up in this new field of criminology are reading his work, and Edwin Sutherland signs off on this decision. He says, yes, the racial crime statistics are doing more harm than good. Uh, because they're essentially legitimizing white supremacist ideas. And just like Jane Addams knew for her European charges, those young people she cared about, she said, using the language of juvenile delinquency and emphasizing crime statistics will encourage the reactionary forces in our society uh, to reject them. And so uh, that's how she handled it. Uh, another researcher, I'm sorry, in Philadelphia, this takes off like wildfire. This is a black woman, um, one of the pioneering uh, black social scientists of this period in the 1920s. Uh, she notes that Philadelphia's black population is only 7.4%, but they represent 25% of the arrests. What are they being arrested for? Being charged with suspicious characters. She calls these needless arrests and gives a few examples. Ten people are arrested, including four women, for being at home. Harry and Moses picked up separately for being on the street. Low level of vagrancy in enforcement, criminalist crimes. For any of you who've seen uh, Slavery by Another Name uh, or read the book, you, you know kind of the the big story about the way in which vagrancy laws in the South, and in fact, vagrancy laws across the world have functioned in this way, which is essentially to police poor people. Um, it gives discretion to the state uh, to, uh, to be coercive, and poor people are not following or playing by the rules. Uh, and so what we see here is vagrancy enforcement uh, here in the North. This is, again, an early version of stop and frisk uh, policing. We also begin to see evidence um, it's not that it wasn't happening, but we began to see evidence of uh, police killings. An Illinois crime survey led by researchers at the University of Chicago did a study in 1926 and 1927, noted that Chicago's population was then only 5%, but they were 30% of those killed by the police, uh, told the story of a 16-year-old Alfred Lingle uh, who was wanted for stealing from a department store. Uh, they went to serve a warrant at his home and uh, killed him in a hail of 35 bullets. More critiques begin to uh, take off. Here's Kelly Miller again 20 uh, plus years later after first responding to Hoffman and to Mississippi Governor Vardaman, noting that too often the policeman club is the only instrument of the law with which the Negro comes into contact. This engenders in him a distrust and resentful attitude toward all public authorities and law officers. None can doubt that such a kindly attitude would go far to convince the Negro of the value to himself and advantage of law obedience and good citizenship. What does this mean? This means that police officers are the leading edge of the state. If the state is abusive, then African Americans own 
relationship to the social contract, their very understanding of their own citizenship is being called into question. This also means Kelly Miller is pointing out something that researchers today, like Philip Atiba Goff, who's one of the leading researchers of implicit bias in policing, would say that policing itself was, quote, criminogenic, meaning more police contact could lead to more criminal activity. Now, even though the research is not moving on the opposite side of the color line in this direction, it is understood that the response to the inequality on the white side of the color line is not more policing, but in fact more social and economic support. Uh, here's a personal testimony from Harlem. Police brutality has been going on for some time, not only in the station house, but on the street. I can recall several instances in which I have been an eyewitness. He's writing to the NAACP in 1922 asking for help. Here from the streets of Philadelphia is a political cartoon. Here we have the home of a Philadelphia taxpayer uh, who is being set upon by whites who don't want the black person to live in their neighborhood. This is Philadelphia, not Jackson, Mississippi. And there the police are not protecting and serving. Well, they are uh, serving white interests but not protecting black homeowners. They should not have moved into this section. Here's a commentary that often, uh, that so much evokes the narrative of the new Jim Crow, a kind of past as prologue, where we have the Philadelphia Negro, which is evoking Du Bois' seminal 1899 study, which spoke to many of the things I write about at length in the book, um, in prison. So again, this is a counter-narrative. If the narrative of incarceration of 30% versus 12% of the over-incarceration had led to Southerners and Northerners using that evidence to justify segregation and systemic discrimination and a robust criminal justice system to deal with black people, this is the counter narrative. Yes, black people are in prison, particularly black men, but they're imprisoned behind the ill will, prejudice, segregated schools and Jim Crowism, not personal morality and chastity as Frederick Hoffman stated a generation before. At the national level, the first National Commission on Law and Observance, several volumes studying the entire criminal justice system, um, in 1931, uh, had one article written by a National Urban League researcher that called attention to the failures of that report to take seriously. Quote, somebody told a lie about the decrease in police brutality. Northern police brutality was ignored while highlighting the sensational cases from the uncivilized wilds of Mississippi. The dragnet arrests of people on the steps of their own homes, beaten in some cases, sent home without a magistrate's he hearing. There are 500 more cases even worse than these. Okay. So, what happened to Bushy's, that 1903 study? What happened to his Italian and Irish criminals? Another way to consider this is how many Italian Americans committed armed robbery last quarter in 2019? Fourth quarter of 2019. $100 to anyone who can guess. How about Irish American burglars? Can, you, can anyone tell me? I mean, this is, I'm at Michigan, right? Number one public university in the country. <laughs> there are no stats. Thank you. They don't exist. So why don't they exist? Because Edwin Sutherland, uh, who also accepted that we shouldn't have racial crime statistics for black folks, um, pointed out that the second generation, that is those uh, who were born here in the United States, appear to approach the native born of native parentage in regard to the kinds of crime committed. So for Edwin Sutherland, well, if they just look like regular white people, why should we care that they're Italian or Irish? But can black people ever look like regular white people or brown people? That's a question for perhaps our Gen Ys to answer. So this is the equivalent of statistical white flight. That is that by no longer being subject to statistical surveillance, then you lose the capacity to make all sorts of policy decisions based on this particular demographic group and their behavior. So how did that take place national level? In 1933, which was really the first or second year that the Uniform Crime Reports, which are still the most authoritative source of local arrest statistics in this country to this day, had this to say, it is believed that figures pertaining to the number of Negroes and foreign-born whites who were arrested and fingerprinted can most fairly be presented by showing them in proportion to the number of such individuals in the general population of the country. Okay, so if they're overrepresented for these particular groups, you should be watching them. So these are the troublesome groups. There's an unstated baseline here, which is that native-born whites are people we shouldn't worry about, no matter what they do. 
But these people we should watch out for. By 1940, they had this to say. It is significant to point out that the figure for native whites includes the immediate descendants of foreign-born individuals. That is actually statistical white flight. OK, so I'm going to blast through a bunch of reports. Harlem has an uprising. They call it a riot in 1935. It's the first directed economic exploitation triggered by, uh, by a le but actual police violence against the Puerto Rican youth, although he is not killed. Um, and then another man was shot in the back by a patrolman in the madness that ensues. Um, this is a breakdown of the actual crime statistics in Harlem that became part of a report, another Blue Ribbon Commission report. Um, and so when they looked at the, the data, you know, what do we see here? That homicide and, and felonious assault represent no more than barely 6% of the alleged crimes of Harlemites, mostly the way they're being police for social disorder offenses. And same thing for women in that sample. Figures cannot be regarded as an index of criminality of the Negro. Aside from the economic and social factors involved in Negro crime, these figures reflect the attitudes and arbitrary practices, as we shall see, of the police of Harlem. Uh, so there's never been a moment where black people weren't pointing out what some of us might say today is the obvious. And yet, it hasn't seemed to work. I'm going to skip that and go to the Kerner Commission report. So here is the Kerner Commission report, 1968. The policeman in the, ne the ghetto is the most visible symbol, finally, of a society from which ghetto Negroes are increasingly alienated. The schools, because so many are segregated, old and inferior, religion, which has become irrelevant to those who have lost faith and lost hope, career aspirations, which for many young Negroes are totally lacking, the family, because its bonds are so often snapped. It is the policeman who must deal with the consequences of this institutional vacuum and is then resented for the presence and the measures of this effort demands. And so they go through a series of um, evidentiary findings of which some of indiscriminate stops and searches, youth taunts of police contribute to harassment of youth, systemic harassment, aggressive preventive patrol. The beat patrolman himself is expected to participate and to file a minimum number of stop and frisk. So we haven't even gotten to the era that we actually call stop and frisk. So what do they recommend? The same things that have been recommended in Chicago, more police protection of residents, independent citizen reviews, develop community policing, better treatment. And in fact, one of the most famous social scientists of the period, a man named Kenneth Clark, whose research informed the Brown decision, he was a social psychologist and did the doll studies, which pointed out the fact that black children were preferring white dolls to black dolls because of a sense of low self-esteem. Here, he writes in the Kerner Commission report, I read the report of the 1919 riot in Chicago as if I were reading the report of the investigating committee of the Harlem riot of 1935, the report of the investigating committee of the Harlem riot of 1943, the report of the McCone Commission on the Watts riot, which had occurred in 1965. I must again in candor say to you members of the commission, it is a kind of Alice in Wonderland with the same moving picture we've shown over and over again, the same analysis, the same recommendation, the same inaction. And enter the great age of CompStat. And the great era of mass incarceration with the evidence of disproportionality. And then the defense of stop and frisk. Here is Ray Kelly in, eight, in August of 2013. It doesn't mean that people are not doing anything wrong. If you look at the statute, it says reasonable suspicion that individuals may be about to commit a crime. There's a preventive aspect to this. People say innocent. That is not the appropriate word. So, right? If you're black and live in a stop and frisk zip code, you are not innocent. That's not the appropriate word. Your constitutional rights don't apply. You live in a separate part of the nation. And so uh, I'll skip that when he talks about the Rand Corporation, uh, which should give us all heebie-jeebies, uh, because essentially it's a gesture to another kind of social science legitimacy that says, because the social scientists have run the numbers, they say this is OK. Uh, and the ACLU took a slightly different approach and pointed out that over the course of the 1990s through the 2000s, out of 4.4 million stops, felony arrests actually were flat. So there's no moment when we see uh, an uptick and then a downturn in terms of felony arrests. Uh, but broken windows, what we do see is a massive uptick in summonses, people getting tickets, and some misdemeanor arrests. And what were they? They look a lot like what the Harlem report showed or what the Philadelphia 
uh, investigation of 1924, needless arrests, suspicious characters, kind of all looks the same. And so black people's presence, political aspirations, and poverty have been met with more and more and more and more policing. And so in Ferguson, city officials have frequently asserted that the harsh and disparate results of Ferguson's law enforcement system do not indicate problems with police or court practices, but instead reflect a pervasive lack of personal responsibility among certain segments of the community. Of course, they also found out the stereotypes, unlawful bias against, and stereotypes. We discovered emails circulated by police supervisors of stereotypical racial minorities as criminals, including one email that joked about an abortion by an African-American woman being a means of crime control. And so here we are again, full circle. We might see these lynching statistics as the obvious way that we should see them a form of state-sanctioned domestic terrorism. But people like Rudolph Giuliani, as recently as 2015, I know he's a different person now for many people, uh, but in 2015, you know, he's saying it's because blacks commit murder eight times more per capita than any other group in society. When I assigned police officers with Commissioner Bill Braden, we did it based on statistics. We didn't do it based on race. Is that even possible? If there were a lot of murders in the community, we put a lot of police officers there. So remember Jane Addams said, you could read in the daily newspaper something about a Polish youth shooting the brains out of an Irish boy. Did she put more police officers in the community? No. And so I like to think of this as a version of a lynching role. These are all the cities since 1995 that have been under federal consent decree. And so in an era where 32 Blue Lives Matter bills have been proposed, only a couple have been passed, that's the political context in our moment where the jury's still out about what we are to make of these consent decrees. Like the lynching rolls, are these consent decrees evidence of state-sanctioned violence against black and brown communities? Or like the lynching rolls in the hands of Frederick Hoffman and others, evidence of a systemic problem of bad behavior like the Ferguson Police Department claimed it to be? Or in the way that Rudolph Giuliani uh, continues to say, I find it very disappointing that you're not discussing the fact that 93% of blacks in America are killed by other blacks. I would like the attention paid to that. Kind of like Mary Plummer referring to the evidence of disproportionate crime rates in Chicago. And so here's Mayor Bloomberg in defense, um, yes, the same Michael Bloomberg that's running for president now, in defense of stop and frisk in 2013. In that case, incidentally, I think we disproportionately stop whites too much and minorities too little. It's exactly the reverse of what they're saying. I don't know where they went to school, but they certainly didn't take a math course or a logic course. And so I'm going to end here um, with what's happening at our border. Uh, because the context for understanding the impact of mass incarceration on our society and racial criminalization or mass incriminalization uh, metastasizes in every direction in our society. It's not just a problem of criminal offending of actual citizens or alleged criminal offending, but the logic of criminalizing another group of people as the basis of restricting their freedom in one form or another is precisely what has been taking place at the, at the border. And to put a finer point on this, the choice to single out this group or that one in crime data, data has always been a reflection of ideological and political power and still is. In the midst of the Trump administration's efforts to enact the first Muslim travel ban, officials wanted to create what? New crime data. Section 10 of Executive Order 13769 called for enhanced statistical surveillance of the crimes of certain foreign nationals. No matter how many more white Americans commit acts of domestic terrorism than others, Section 10 was aimed at stigmatizing and banning Muslim immigrants. The same held true in the administration's call for a national emergency at the border. No matter how law-abiding immigrants are compared to their native counterparts, Trump officials insisted, based on their own creative math, that Central Americans are a criminal menace. And so we should note the same is happening with the opioid crisis. Here is data of premature death across America uh, related to mostly whites, but not only whites, um, in the opioid epidemic. 
And we could read this evidence as evidence of personal irresponsibility. But that's not how we're reading this. We're reading this in the language of Chris Christie, the former governor of New Jersey, my state. If we give people the tools and support they need to overcome this disease, and if we choose to free people from the stigma of addiction and recognize this as a public health challenge, we can help people to reclaim their lives. We can find the true measure of our compassion. The investments we're making will change lives and get more people into treatment earlier. This is the same story of the army of unfortunates. Even Trump himself says, for those already addicted, we are delivering life-saving help and spending $1 billion to address prevention treatment and recovery. Tremendous amounts of money and care have been given to specialty facilities for heroin users. People are hiring these inmates. They're getting a second and sometimes a third chance. And as candidate Trump, remember, we have to bring back, back law and order in places like Chicago, citing crime rates as evidence of African Americans and Hispanics living in hell because it's so dangerous. And so in light of human rights, a 1951 petition after the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights went forward uh, by the Civil Rights Congress, published in a book later called We Charge Genocide, uh, where essentially described the instances of police brutality um, as the scourge of the crisis in black America. And on that basis, uh, the United Nations needed to intervene and to challenge the United States. Didn't happen. And so I end with Dr. King who himself helped to globalize the black freedom struggle in seeking to hold the United States to moral and ethical standards beyond its own borders, recognizing the lawlessness of our American legal system. Many whites who oppose open housing would deny that they are racist. They turn to sociological arguments, the crime rate in the Negro community, the lagging cultural standards, the fear that their schools will become academically inferior, the fear that property values will depreciate in order to find excuses for their opposition. They never stop to realize that criminal responses are environmental, not racial. To hem a people up in the prison walls of overcrowded ghettos and to combine them in a rat-infested slums is to breed crime, whatever the racial group may be. It is a strange and twisted logic to use the tragic results of segregation as an argument for its continuation. That was published in the last book that Dr. King ever wrote. And so his challenge remains our challenge. Thank you. So we're gonna do uh, lightning round questions. I will not answer any question to anyone's satisfaction, but I'll do the best that I can. Since we're short on time, maybe we can collect three questions or so and then have you reply. Would that be okay? Sure. If you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll come to you with the microphones. Yep. One second. I'm coming to you. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. One of my concerns is that, you know, I think the quicker we successfully dismantle uh, the carceral state, the stronger the backlash will be, and uh, the stronger uh, detractors' voices will be about how we're decriminalizing uh, too many people who deserve to be in prison. My question is, how do we uh, fight against that kind of rhetoric, and how do we ensure that there's not a backslide whereby more people are surveilled or um, imprisoned? Yeah. Thank you. Other so, questions? Oh. paper to keep track of these questions. I actually have a similar question. I'm just repeating to emphasize, I think, how important it is for people in higher education communities where we're more apt to talk about these things than other workplaces, is which do you think is more important, um, working and mobilizing people who already understand these issues and are on the right side morally, or is it trying to persuade people who continue um, like the quote that you have from Martin Luther King, continue to see things in a way that is, um, I don't know how to describe it, except just in total opposition to reality. <laughs> it is hard to, uh, to explain. So I, I will say that um, people who have been focusing on narrative change or education, which is what this is, um, this version of, of advocacy, uh, is working. I mean, the conversation around mass incarceration 
uh, was trapped inside of activist spaces and a very small number of nonprofits like the Sentencing Project. Many of you probably have never even heard of the Sentencing Project because it's been drowned out uh, by the explosion of a number of nonprofit organizations that are doing this kind of work. Um, but the Sentencing Project, going back to the very early 1990s, was, was pointing out, for example, that the drug war was thoroughly racialized um, and did a lot of the early work to point out the crack cocaine problem um, at, relative to powder cocaine, uh, talked about the, the need to decriminalize marijuana because marijuana was far less addictive and dangerous than alcohol, which it basically claims annually the lives of many, many more people than all illegal narcotics until recently, until recently. <laughs> so, um, so I say that to say that it's a both and. Um, education has to continue to be a core part of the work um, in every space. And some people are more comfortable talking to the choir. Other people are more comfortable talking uh, as, as evangelists to people who, you know, who haven't been saved yet, quote unquote. Um, so I think everyone has to get into a lane that they feel most effective in, in being able to gauge different audiences. The politics have, all, have moved in the opposite direction, however. So advocacy, I think, has been working. Education has been working, but the politics have gone uh, nuclear in a retrograde manner. Um, some people will say that's evidence of progress because the stakes, the pressure is mounting and the stakes have grown and therefore um, you keep pushing. Uh, it remains to be seen. I'm a historian, not a, you know, a, a predictor. Uh, but I would say um, that for me, people who are most comfortable, whether it's the activist lane, the advocacy lane, and the distinction I make there is that advocates tend to be lawyers or lawyer types working in official nonprofit spaces, which can often be polluted by their own blind spots and mission problems as compared to activists who can also be at each other's throats, and so you know all these spaces are complicated. Uh, and then the education space. Um, my personal take on this is that our politics are not going to move off of this pendulum until we change our narrative of American exceptionalism. Um, until we stop telling Americans that the first responsibility of government is public safety. Um, and everything else is less important, which is essentially what we uh, have been arguing for the last 40 or 50 years since the war on poverty. Uh, one of the ironies of this um, critique of Bratton that I'm presenting here from the Heritage Speech, and which is also in the new preface, uh, is that where Bratton is leading today, um, along with someone named Thomas Apt, who's written a book called Bleeding Out, you also hear this from other um, reformers, police reformers, is that they're going to deliver to black communities the violence prevention and reduction that they truly deserve because that's the civil rights legacy that hasn't been fulfilled yet. So think about this. Our leading national police folks are telling the black community that their civil rights agenda is lowering violence in that community first and foremost. The leading crime economist at the University of Chicago, a man named Yez Ludwig, is arguing this point. You can Google all of these people and watch to your heart's content. Um, nowhere on any civil rights poll that I've looked at is violence reduction at the top. Do black communities want safety? Do they want to be free of harm and fear in their communities? Absolutely. But do they recognize that the trade-offs between sending more police officers in those communities versus worrying about the dangerous offenders in their communities is a wash at best, um, means that these particularly white male elites are ignoring the actual voices within the community or cherry picking the ones that serve their own purposes. OK, so finally, to answer your question, this is going to be totally unsatisfying. This is just one part of a policy puzzle that is really jacked up, right? We could go down the line. So I personally think we ought to invest a whole lot more time in getting these histories in the uh, social studies books and in the school curriculums of our elementary school students. And just so you know, I'm not crazy because you know, to me that's a form of social vaccination that actually makes people better people. Um, and therefore, these policies don't sound crazy, like, oh, we should treat black communities like the citizens with the constitutional rights that they deserve. How about that? Um, 
And so just so you don't think I'm crazy, in Chicago, in the wake of a police torture settlement uh, that went on for 20 years in that city, part of the agreement based on activists was to teach the torture case of John Burge to all elementary school students in Chicago public schools. So they had to write a curriculum, and now every kid in that school system will learn about police torture, um, which makes for citizens who are more vigilant about the state's capacity to do harm in your own name. OK, one last question. I th that was just too. I'm, af I'm afraid we have to close, oh, but right. um, uh, you can come up to the front and talk to Professor Muhammad. Uh, please you. join me in thanking Professor Muhammad.